Did I work? No. <laughs> <laughs> You've already done your work. You're just, you're in retirement. I'm retired. You're in final, and final and retirement. Join. <laughs> good for you. Financial Phil joins us via telephone. Philip, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, guys. How are you all? I'm doing well. I'm going to bring up Dylan's uh, slide as well because I know you had a little conversation with Chill and Dylan before you went on the air. How, how'd that go, Dylan, by the way? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to take it easy on Dylan. Dylan's a good man. He's a good man. And I know that we've got a three game stretch coming up that includes a trip to Baltimore. So I'm also trying to. to to parse my smack talk because I don't want to get it back. And just <laughs> Of course, your definition of easing up and being nice to him is probably different than his <laughs> definition. The Steelers. Uh, maybe. The, uh, you know. Good, good, uh, Dylan. I know you, you were struggling yesterday, man. Uh, yeah, I was. It felt it was the, one of the more demoralizing losses for the, maybe the most of the, of the season so far, even though it might be the, it's probably the best team that they've lost to. Overall, other than second best team, <clears throat> uh, you know, I was going to say other than the Chiefs, but actually, no, third best team, third best. Team. Uh, it was a tough day for Dylan yesterday because you were really down on Russell Wilson back in August, July and August, uh, Dylan, and he did he did amazingly well yesterday. And, well, and I think you predicted the Steelers would go zero and seventeen. Phil, that's what I heard during his show that they were he had yeah, hit I Nick think Coast. You said that. <laughs> 12 o'clock, yes, I think I'm pretty sure. And the Ravens were going to be 18-0 and 0 in a 17-game season. That's how high Dylan was on them? Well, he, here's the thing about the Steelers game yesterday is I think you could score about 21 points at least on the Bengals' defense with Bill Stubblefield at quarterback. <laughs> I don't know. He can't scramble. I'm pretty agile. I don't he can't know I'm scramble. Agile. Unless he's walking dogs, he ain't moving too much, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. Keep going. Keep going. I'm with you. <laughs> I got nothing bad to say about the Steelers, but I got plenty bad to say about the Ravens. I, Justin Tucker, I don't know. It might be time. Like, not even at the end of the season. It's just to be like, who, who's out on the street at this point? Like, I'm, I, I'm, I think I'm, I don't know if this is a slump he's, he can pull out of. It's his first ever slump, isn't it? But, but you cannot get rid of the best of all time just uh, because he's had a couple of three bad games, even though you won't do, but you owe it to him to keep him at least to the end of the season. He, he's, he's been worse on longer field goals the last few years, especially last year. But now it's started that you can tell it's in his head. So maybe he can, he can pull out of it. But uh, I, I just don't know. He is 35, which some, a lot, you know, plenty of kickers can – be accurate past that but he's just he's like the the worst kicker in the league right now you know what is he 17 of 24 on the year dylan um i don't remember his exact numbers but i know he's something like 15 or 20 percent lower on like 40 plus and 50 plus yard field goals than the league average he has been great for a long time and every kicker goes through this at some point but at his age you have to start to ask the question is is this because of age or is he just Having a you know is it the yips, and and uh, there's only one way to find that out. That's stick with him. Now, what are the yips, Rob? You know, you, who who was Steve Sachs? Remember Steve Sachs, the second baseman for the Dodgers, suddenly yeah. developed a fear of throwing the baseball to first base, hmm. and he couldn't do it. You, you just something's going on mentally, and it prevents you from doing something you should be able to do easily. And I don't know what the cause of it is. I don't know if psychologists know what the cause of it is, but it every once in a while, it hits somebody famous, and it really stands out when it hits him. He's uh, Tucker's missing almost every field goal to the left, and then yesterday he they lined up one on the right hash mark where you know you do have to hook it a little left. And I was like, well, he's probably gonna <laughs> miss this one, and then he did. And then the next one they lined up in the same place, and he pushed it to the right. So you'd like overcompensate. You could tell it's mm -hmm. it's just it's in his head. I don't know. He's had a great career. I think Dylan, you want, would you like uh, to see him replaced at this point, or you you thinking about another week or two? I I don't want to say I, I want to think that he can pull out of it, but at this point, I just don't know. It's week thirteen, and it's been a problem all year, and it's there there. It's not like it, he was you know ninety eight percent accuracy last year or the last three years or anything. It's been a little. He's been worse the last three years or so. I wouldn't uh, make any drastic changes until after the Steeler game if I was you guys. Phil, do you agree? I, I agree completely. Do exactly what you're doing right now. <laughs> which is losing to good things. <laughs> just, just keep doing that. 
<laughs> I will say the Eagles are really good, and it wasn't just Justin Tucker. The but, you know, because the, the offensive line for the Ravens got dominated too. The Eagles are always strong up front. Both lines are usually very good. That's the way they built their team, and that's a smart way to build. If you're strong up front, you got a chance every game. Uh, thank you, Dylan. Uh, financial Phil, November is over. What kind of a financial month was November? November was a really good month, but in particular, and we talked about this some um, this morning, is that there was there's been a broadening of the market. So we, now we've got this narrative going on the S and P 493, if you will, versus the Max Seven, and the Max Seven Nvidia being one the probably the best one of that group has drugged the S and P all year long, but in November there's been a broadening. Not only did the S and P 493 outperform the Max Seven, but so did the mid and small caps. And most investors see that as a positive sign that we're not top heavy. It's more than just a few companies that's doing well. It's the overall market. So we we saw that occur in November. Now, son, there's a lot of people that's really, really heavy in growth or tech, and that's all they have in their portfolio. So they probably didn't get the same bump as everybody else. But if you remain diversified and you still had some of those small caps, there's a great day coming for small caps. It's already started kind of, but those small companies have, have lagged the large companies, and, and that started to reverse course in November. But the uh, but if you're one that were heavy in growth stocks, you, you didn't get the same bump as everybody else. But overall, November was a really good month, and where I, fi- where I find the most positivity, and yep, I'm going to bring up the Federal Reserve again, are those measures that the Federal Reserve would look at the, in order to be more aggressive in cutting rates didn't occur even though there was a rate cut, but those the, the uh, inflation numbers and the employment numbers, they didn't support aggressive rate cuts going into 2025, and our market still performed well. And I find that to be a really positive side moving into December in 2025. Think of uh, December. You think of a Santa rally, Phil. First and foremost, what is a Santa rally? And secondly, are we going to get one? Well, Santa Claus rally, I think uh, mainly what I think you see in December really isn't what we think it is. But when you see a December rally, typically the last 10 to 15 days of the year, I think a lot of that is positioning, taking gains, selling, buying in order to do that. So there's a lot of activity. But what our perception of it is, is we start to get retail reports and and, and first out type of reports that people are spending money in big box retail is doing well and all that starts with uh black friday and cyber monday and all the special days that that we have leading up to christmas so as reports and and they're anecdotal but as reports of that starts to come in it's about the same time as we start to get a lot of tax selling and rebalancing in portfolios in order to either shore up some capital gains recognize some losses but with what we do with that money is the most important thing so if I'm going to sell something to either recognize capital gain or recognize capital loss, and, and even in mutual funds do the same thing, what do I do with the cash that's created from that? And if I purchase something else, then that's a good thing. If I don't, then that's where the Santa Claus rally kind of fizzles out. Well, do we get one this year? I think there's a lot of positivity in the market, and I don't want to predict it because we're always – you're wrong 50% of the time that when you predict, but there's a lot of positive things going on right now. Number one is although you know November didn't really prove out to be a, a positive sign for inflation and the Federal Reserve being aggressive, we are still in a rate-cutting environment, so that is still positive. And like we had said before, the broadening out of the markets. And eventually, the thought is eventually the more broad that becomes, in a, in a rotation, remember that word we used to use it a lot after COVID, but a rotation into value companies that eventually those the big tech and the MAG-7 will look attractive again, and there'll be money pouring into those for another leg on the bull markets. Our bull markets have been taking off with growth companies. So if they slow down and don't give a lot back, if that growth sector, think of NASDAQ, if it slows down and doesn't give too much back, and then there's a broadening out of the market where the next leg is either a fall or growth companies take off again. And most experts think that leading into 2025 that there's still more room to run with the MAG-7. You used to talk about the Russell 2000 a lot, Phil, small cap stocks. And uh, during times of high interest rates and inflation like we had 
recently, at least relatively high. Those of us who were alive in the 70s know that this didn't come close <laughs> to what happened in the 70s. Uh, but uh, at that time, it became difficult with uh, small cap stocks. Now, my part of my wife's TSP account as a Fed is invested in small cap stocks. And during that time, I was listening to radio shows uh, talking about get out of small caps. Uh, you want to you want to get into, you know, this or that or, or whatever. Uh, but is it also not true that if you're dollar cost averaging, Phil, and you're just contributing uh, each each paycheck, you're still buying up the price of those stocks as they fall, that you can get a pretty good charge into your account once those stock prices start to come back up? Yes, absolutely. And then, you know, we talk about this idea of diversification. So even if some, I hope they're, they're putting a tagline on it, if there's a financial show or someone giving advice, to get out of, and I'm doing air quotes right now, to get out of an asset class, I hope what they mean is be underweight in an asset class but still maintain some exposure to that. But you're exactly right. The dollar cost averaging that most of us do in our 401K or TSPs, whatever retirement plan that we have, it's actually a good thing. And you have to. It, it's really hard to wrap your mind around it, but it's actually a good thing with volatility because you're purchasing at a lower price. So you don't really want a constant, slow, steady climb up in a dollar cost averaging world. You want that volatility and you want those drops so that you can purchase at a lower price. But looking back, and you, and you had mentioned we used to talk a lot about the Russell 2000 and the small caps. Let's look back at November. November alone, the Russell was up over 10 percent uh, in just November alone. So if you would have taken that advice and gotten out of and that's why we're always fearful of removing diversification because when you get out of an asset class what is the signal to come back is that signal a 10 and a half percent return uh, that we got in november and you've missed out on that because you had you had gotten out at the at the time that they had told you to and didn't dollar cost average in or didn't hold any exposure to that but on a one month basis the russell was up over 10 percent over a six-month time period, it's up 18.5%. So one of the better performing asset classes as inflation has come down and it has slowed down. It's not down to that target yet, but as it has slowed and rates begin to come down, one of the biggest benefactors is a small cap company. Good morning, Phil. Uh, uh, you mentioned inflation. Uh, the market responds to anticipation. Uh, there's a lot of talk by the Trump administration that tariffs are going to be imposed, and every day there's a new tariff with toward a different group of people. How's that going to affect the market? It's going to slow the Federal Reserve down, and it's already one of the thought processes behind uh, the post-election rally, why I had given a little bit of it back anyway is because, because of that narrative that, hey, if he does these infl these tariffs, like he says he's going to, and I'm not saying tariffs are good or bad. Um, I'm, I'm not really making a comment on that. But tariffs are an inflationary pressure. As those prices get more expensive, even prices at home will become more expensive. And those pundits that say, well, the consumer pays that, they're, they're partially right. The consumer does pay that. The whole idea behind tariffs is to, funnel business into, in my opinion, funnel business into U.S. companies so they're on a, more of a level playing field as far as prices are concerned. But if my widget from a foreign country is $20 and the widget at home, I always use widgets. Everybody says, what's a widget? And I don't really know. But if it's $20 coming from a foreign country and $10 here at home, I, I guarantee you those prices here at home, at, that $10 won't stay there. They don't need that big of a gap but to remain competitive. So those also will become more expensive. So that is an inflationary pressure, and that's one of the thought processes behind people saying that the Federal Reserve is going to slow down and be more careful until we see what's going to happen with these tariffs and when they're imposed. And it'll take a while for those tariffs to take effect, so the Federal Reserve has to keep that in mind. So they would slow that rate process or that rate-cutting process down and that, and, and in effect, that should hurt our markets. Now, the, the the tone of the Federal Reserve, even though they had one rate cut, the tone of the Federal Reserve since the election has been that they're going to slow it down, and it has been supported by recent inflationary uh, numbers and job numbers, and that has nothing to do with uh, with the the election or tariffs because that hasn't even happened yet. So the, our markets are saying, well, wait a minute. 
if they're going to slow down anyway, and we've got another bump in the road with inflation, which it appears that we have, it is it, the the rate of disinflation has slowed, and now we throw tariffs on top of it as early as January. What's that mean for the Federal Reserve other than a really, really, really slow rate cutting process? See, I think tar- tariffs are are actually a great negotiating uh, arm. It's a bit, it's a bit of um, diplomacy through fear that if, if, if you do this, then we're going to impose a tariff on you. That was the, over the weekend, I guess it was the Trump's threat to impose a hundred percent tariff on any nation that tries to devalue the dollar. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and according to wall street journal, the dollar is stronger today. I don't know if, if correlation and causality are the same thing in this circumstance, but I think that there's, you know, it, once a tariff hits, it has an effect of inflationary or whatever the, the, the economic impact is. But right now, I think it's, it's a political weapon more than it is an economic weapon. Yeah, and I don't, I don't disagree with you with the use of tariffs. And, and again, no comment on whether I like or dislike. But they, like you had just said, now once they do hit, right now it's just verbiage. Right. But if, if when they do hit, and it takes a while, just like rate cuts, it's going to take a while for that to make its way through the economy. So it's not as if on January 15th that they're going to say, hey, we're going to impose these tariffs, and on January 16th everybody's prices go through the roof. It's going to take a while for that to occur, six months to even a year before we'll start to see some of what's going to be impacted by that. So I hope, hopefully they're very surgical with tariffs, and they do it on items and countries that we can kind of deal with, and it doesn't impact us that much. I would switch back to um... – well, essentially market timing, which I know is a fool's errand. Nobody should do that. But um, we were talking about getting in and out of different sectors. Back 20 years ago, give or take, um, we had the dot-com bubble where a lot of people made a lot of money. And, and those who sensed that, wow, this is a, kind of a little hot right now, given that there's there's no actual product coming out, they got to keep their money. The folks who rode the wave too long lost a lot of money once the bubble broke. Do you get a sense now, um, are there any sectors that feel too bloated to you right now that where you would advise your clients, uh, you might want to slow down in that sector a little bit for the time being? Uh, we, we would make sure that the asset allocation is appropriate so we're not too overweight in one sector, especially when you look at technology right now. But by and large, when you look at the value of these companies for what they're trading for, they're, n- they're not near what they were during the dot-com bubble or during 2008, 2009. So those valuations are a little bit more in line, if you will, so on a safer level than what they were back then. But you always get concerned of, about an asset class when you look at a certain asset class or company. You make it as large or as small as you like and you've seen outrageous returns on it, and then you start looking for justification. Does this make sense for, for why it happened? Is the proof in the pudding, if you will, when we look at balance sheets and, and their earnings call, are they or is that being supported? And, and no better example, really, than NVIDIA. NVIDIA had blown out expect, expectations at every level, and then the one time that they just beat them, just beat expectations or met expectations, the stock price had fallen. So you can see that fear, underlying fear, even with NVIDIA. Even though the proof was in the pudding with NVIDIA all year long, the one time that it didn't, and, and Rob, it really confused me, it really confused me as well, but when it, it just met expectations, the price fell. We got so used to them blowing out expectations, having so much proof in the pudding, if you will, that, but that fear is always there with something that runs up a lot. So for us, the diversification is, is and with our blinders on, if we say, hey, look, we don't want any more than 16% of large cap growth or 19% of large cap growth in our portfolio, it doesn't matter at, at all what's going on in the markets. If it hits that 19% and starts to exceed that, we start trimming it back. It does not matter what the outlook or anything of that nature is, we start cutting that back. So there's a certain percentage of each, each asset class uh, that, that we target. There will be times of underweight and underweight. It's not necessarily timing, but underweight and overweight. For example, when we knew rates were coming up, there was some underweight going on with the small caps. But as, as it peaked out around 9 o'clock, we, that quickly turned to overweight to get back in. So that we don't really view that as timing. 
other than, look, we know this is going to happen a few years ago with bonds, and you knew inflation when it, when it read at 9%. You knew that the rates weren't coming down anytime soon. That was pretty much common sense. So we were underweight on the bond side. And then as rates start to come down for those very conservative clients, we started moving back into them. Uh, Phil, carrying that one step farther, and let's tie it back to policy, policy from the administration. Uh, there are certain areas that uh, that uh, incoming President Trump has voiced skepticism toward. One is climate change. Uh, as you advise your uh, your clients uh do you take something as let's use climate change as an example would you advise them to uh divest themselves of companies that depend upon this particular niche or would you just let market go whichever way it wants to go again it would be the market would go whichever way it wants to go but most of the time when we see people that want to invest in green energy and and some of the, some of those uh climate change type companies uh, we always want to make sure that we look at those. Let's remove, let's put our blinders back on and look at what a certain company is doing, what a certain asset class is doing, and then say, let's wait a second. And we know that these policies are either going to or not going to come into place, and it would or would not favor a certain asset class. So be really careful when you invest with your uh, emotion or your beliefs, if you will, as far as green or whether it's a religious portfolio we've had a, a handful of people that wanted to invest in religious portfolios and, and believe me they're out there and it always blows my mind when people want to do that but from that standpoint we're looking at the basics of a company how they performed with their blinders on but you are correct and especially as it pertains to green energy if someone says hey give me some green energy in my portfolio we're going to say well let's look at the outlook of this and let's look at what their earnings expectations may be over the next four years because it may not be as favorable as what it was before by the way intel has replaced their ceo pat uh, gelsinger he's out the uh, intel stock prices are up five percent phil only a minute and a half left here what are you be looking forward to report wise this week uh, jobs report on friday and i think there's a huge importance on that because there was a step back and there was a slowdown in jobs throughout the strikes and the hurricanes and now as we head into this season with shopping is it going to be a huge bump and will our and i'm going to use a, a dirty word will our federal reserve consider that to be transitory is it temporary that these jobs have jumped and will it change their mind with what they do with interest rates moving forward i think it will right now the odds are about two two-thirds that they're going to have a rate cut in December, and I don't think we're going to. I don't think there's going to be a rate cut in December, and that will be supported by this Friday's jobs report. That's, there's my prediction. John, you had a thought a moment ago. No, that's okay. I'm good. It passed? It did. It did. Financial Phil, how do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue. Right here, Marksburg. All right, Steelers Browns this Sunday. Phil, what's your choice? What's your pick? Give me a score. Man, I'm telling you, our Steelers are going to be hot. They're coming back into Pittsburgh after a loss to the Browns. I'm giving the Pittsburgh Steelers a 30 to 10 win. We're going to get those Brownies back. We got some revenge coming. Phil, have a great day. Thank you, sir. Go Steelers. Yeah. <laughs>